Okay, thank you very much. As I was trying to explain to um, Rose, I spent the morning assiduously trying to avoid saying anything that I might say this afternoon in the hope that I'd still leave myself with something to say. Uh, I think I've managed to do that more or less, but um, I think I've also managed to kind of talk myself out. Um, so I'm trying to kind of build up a bit of momentum now and uh, focus back on my topic and learn my lines. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about mobiles and education specifically in Africa. Um, and I guess it's, the reason is partly because it's a, it's a timely thing to do. I think there's, there's lots happening. Um, but the lots that's happening is potentially quite problematic. And that's, that's what I wanted to unpack, if you like. Uh, and it's quite easy to start um, a talk like this by um, rolling out some case studies, rolling out some examples, looking back at some projects, and maybe, and also being wildly optimistic. Um, and maybe five years ago that might have been what I would have done. I could have just talked about a project and we could have all gone away with a kind of happy glow that the future was opening up for us. It all seemed to make sense and uh, progress would take place. Um, and these days I kind of worry that actually I'm probably more part of the problem than I am the solution. Um, to, to do the bit of the bio that may have some, um, some, some relevance, I've been working in mobile learning here since about the year 2000 and I guess I'm a fairly active and prominent member of uh, the research community around the idea of using mobiles um, in education and I think we've moved from a, a definition of that research agenda that was originally formulated in terms of uh, using mobile technologies and that being the defining characteristic to so hopefully a bit more robust abstract kind of a definition in terms of mobility, the mobility of people, people moving around, people crossing contexts, people working in different contexts, and, and maybe the, um, uh, the mobile technology merely being the kind of pretext, the vehicle um, f that facilitates that happening. Uh, but as I, the part of the conversation that I was having this morning was around, I think, that position, that way of opening up that area of research that was built around um, if you like, university-driven research that saw people like me maybe at the vanguard of, I don't know, technology-enhanced learning or e-learning has run out of road. Um, uh, and the reasons might become apparent or might even be obvious now anyway, that kind of everyone's got mobiles. Everyone they thinks, as it were, they understand how they can be used for learning. They can download apps. Practitioners don't need to ask researchers. Policymakers don't need to ask researchers. And the researchers in question, people like me, I think, need to kind of reposition what they do in the light of a society that is awash with mobile technology. We've moved from an era 10 years ago where it was expensive, unreliable, um, and scarce to um, a society where it's coming out of the wallpaper, uh, where it's cheap, ubiquitous, easily understood, reliable, uh, and from an institutional point of view, we're on the back foot. That's a kind of aside, but kind of maybe contextualizes my history because I've been involved in mobile learning projects through those 10 years. Uh, some have been in, in Western Europe, some have been um, in Southern Africa, and some have been in other places. But I think the whole of that history is now kind of problematic or maybe pointless, who knows. Um, but throughout that goes the notion that um, mobile technologies, because of their coverage, because of all sorts of reasons, can take learning into um, to individuals, communities, people, regions that were previously inaccessible to other educational interventions. And were this a talk about mobile learning per se, then I suppose I'd then flesh it out a bit by saying I don't just mean places where the infrastructure is poor or where there are issues of distance or sparsity in the geometric or geographical sense, but actually also where there is social distance, if you like, or economic distance, where we're working with what we'd call in the UK non-traditional learners, people who have no experience of learning or of higher education in their street or in their family, um, and where mobiles are an accessible and familiar medium that allow us to create a connection with them. Or maybe projects with the homeless or, or travellers, um, you know, again, where it's not quite just an infrastructural problem, but actually it's a social problem. They might be intimidated or unfamiliar with the institutions of learning, and mobile devices have allowed us to cross that, that barrier. And as I say, were it 
a, a talk about mobile learning per se, then I'd kind of go down that route and explain how I think we've achieved something, but maybe not as much as we'd liked. But you can easily see how much of that kind of argument translates into much of a developing world or an African context. Um, and my point and my worry is that learning with mobiles in Africa is assumed to be more or less a no-brainer. Um, and it's, it, and it's, you can quite easily um, see why. Uh, in ma many parts of Africa, the, the infrastructure, the broadband, mains electricity are largely absent. They're all of those kind of negative features. And on the other hand, there is, certainly in some parts of Africa, very good coverage, near universal ownership, a great deal of acceptance of mobiles. Compared to Western Europe, um, you know, where someone with a computing degree can go into a computing company, uh, in many parts of Africa, for example, Kenya, if you've got a computing degree, you either go to America or you go to the UK or you work in some way or another with mobile phone technology. Um, and I think the mobile phone economy occupies a lot more kind of dynamic, uh, vivacious uh, space compared to um, uh, the, de the developed world, Western Europe, for example, or fin you know, Finland, where everyone already owns three phones. Um, and the corollary of that in some way is actually that the networks can see massive opportunities in the global south. They, you know, they talk in terms of their next billion subscribers. And for them possibly, or for publishers, um, learning with mobiles, education, is potentially um, added value to their offering. It's something they can bolt alongside uh, all of the other things they might take to their customers. Uh, and it can, you know, it can maybe provide a more kind of socially responsible face to their, um, their business portfolio. So as I say, it, it ought to be, it looks like it's a no-brainer. Um, you know, it's what we should be doing if we want to use technology to enhance l learning and um, education in many parts of Africa and many parts of the developing world. Um, and there's, actually I don't know how many of my slides are culturally specific, but if anyone wants, um, yeah, I, I can kind of do cultural subtitles if you like. Uh, uh, this is a reference to a um, Danish king uh, in England who thought by um, a royal diktat he could uh, tell the tide not to come in. Okay. Um, uh, okay, and, and there's a, a perceived to be a kind of inevitability around some of this that's, that I think, um, you know, buys into the idea of progress and maybe technological determinism. You know, the technology's there, the market's there, it's going to happen. There's an inevitability about it and you can't turn it back. His name was Canute, by the way. Um, and okay, that point of view, that position was true a year ago, three years ago, um, five years ago. What's been changing, uh, in my view, has been um, an awareness or a, a perception amongst some big players about the fact that this particular idea, its time has come. So, for example, the GSMA, um, uh, who are the uh, global cartel, the business association for the networks, for the MNOs, mobile network operators, um, about a year ago published, yeah, a year ago published something which I think they called M-Learning, Educational Opportunities for the Bottom of the Pyramid, um, which was specifically about, the, well, the bottom of the pyramid in terms of the global pyramid. It, so it wasn't about the bottom of the UK pyramid, the homeless uh, or the marginalised or the disenfranchised in particular. It was specifically about the global south. Uh, and apparently if you point out that actually people with mobile phones are not the bottom of the pyramid, it's the ones without the mobile phones at the bottom of the pyramid, that's considered bad manners. You're not supposed to point that out, that there are actually still people who can't afford mobile phones. But nevertheless, the GSMA's point in doing this, in part, was playing to their audience, not us, but their uh, shareholders, as it were, the various national and international networks. They're trying to sensitise them because they can see this as a growing business opportunity. Um, they can see it as a business case. And previously, the engagement we've seen with um, for multi multinationals working in development with learning technology has been actually 
with their CSR, their Corporate Social Responsibility divisions, not with the parts of the firm that are actually interested in making profits. Um, and this has been very nice and we've loved it, um, but sadly I think it's, it's been barking up completely the wrong tree. It, it, you know, corporate social responsibility uh, and those kinds of activities are done on the basis that um, it, it's something that the company in question wants to walk away from in a year's time. It, you know, it's a fixed amount of money, it's a subsidy, they probably want some photographs, they probably don't want too much evaluation and they'd like it to finish on time because then they can move on to the next one and it will probably be a football team. Um, you know, and I think that has probably encouraged the wrong mindset amongst, for example, educationalists or social activists, that this is a, a route to sustainability. It's actually, a, I, I would argue, a route to non-sustainability. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of pleased that GSMA have published this material and they then ran some workshops in Cape Town, uh, I think in about June of last year, off the back of their M Health um, event there. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pleased that they're doing this because it, it represents, if you like, a reorientation, I hope, uh, towards sustainability because if they're making money out of it, it's going to be sustainable. Um, what we've also seen is the World Mobile Congress, which takes place every year in um, Barcelona in February. They have prizes, you know, in kind of industry prizes, awards and all the rest of it. And again, learning featured for the first time there. Um, so I think that's uh, something of a breakthrough. Um, as a kind of indicator, there's a conference in Doha in Qatar in a couple of weeks' time uh, called WISE, and it's run as a series of debates. And one of those debates, and it's specifically development focused, one of those debates is about um, mobile learning and the hard to reach. So again, I think that's a bit of a breakthrough. And then most recently, uh, in fact, it hasn't quite happened yet, uh, and it's still under discussion. USAID, who kind of sponsor something called the M Health Alliance, um, are on the verge of sponsoring, developing something they'll call the M, the M Education Alliance. There was a symposium in Washington in uh, August, uh, in which some uh, two people from, from Morocco attended, um, that was intended to, to sensitise the USAID community uh, to these possibilities and, and get some feedback about whether this looked like a viable way of doing things. And I guess the, well, it wouldn't have even happened if they thought the answer was going to be no. Um, so I think there is movement there as well. Um, my concern is it's kind of the wrong movement and it's misinformed. And to some extent what I'm doing is talking about the ways in which that might be misinformed. Um, Oh, goodness, this is a bridge um, just down the road from where I live. It's the River Severn. It's a place, a place and a bridge called Iron Bridge. Um, and uh, it's the first Iron Bridge in the world. And the point is, to some extent, that um, it's a slide about development, but it's also a slide about what you do with a new medium. Um, and some people would argue what you do with a new medium is what you couldn't quite do with an old medium. So this is actually looks very similar to a wooden bridge. It just happens to be made out of iron. Um, and after you've done what used to be difficult, you then do what was um, previously impossible, and then you do what was previously inconceivable. And I'm not sure if that's necessarily the trajectory of using technology uh, in learning, but I, I certainly worry about the way in which it gets presented as part of some kind of non-negotiable developmental pro, pro, uh, process. Um, and so when I go to eLearning Africa um, every year, I hear words like leapfrogging and um, catching up. And I worry that that isn't essentially buying into the idea that the trajectory of eLearning is predetermined uh, and the best we can do is kind of short circuit it. Um, and so I, I worry that we're kind of hardwired into a way of thinking about um, these things. Actually, the irony is that the, the, the second most popular phrase in a lot of development conferences is unexpected consequences. Um, uh, I th again, I think one could divert and talk a lot about why that is the case and how we deal with it, but it does seem to be that most activities, development initiatives, don't work out the way, that, the way they were supposed to, and yet we're still doing them. Um, anyway, so as I say, I think that, that um, there's a momentum behind using mobiles Oh, this is the other bit of text. I hope it's legible. Um, part of the rhetoric of using mobiles in education and using mobiles in development is buying into a, 
uh, an idea about progress which maybe ought to be um, unpacked. And part of that um, is a particular idea about the tra trajectory of, of e-learning, um, that we knew, need to do things often in the ways that they were done in Western Europe or North America, um, and that historically in North America and Western Europe what we've done with mobile learning is a reaction to the problems we've had with e-learning. You know, e-learning had uh, the banner about learning anytime, anywhere, which clearly was not true. Um, and a lot of what we've done in mobile learning in the developed world has been making that true. But just because that was the history and the process we went through um, in Britain, for example, doesn't mean it has to be the process that we reenact somewhere else for any number of reasons, some of which are local and some of which are, are global. But I, I worry that our mindset um, in using mobiles um, for learning may have been to some extent prejudiced by um, uh, how we've uh, delivered learning via computers. And oh, sorry, another cultural reference. This is a real grand tour of Europe European thinking, isn't it? Um, uh, the Trojan horse. Okay, the Trojan horse. Um, yes, one of my colleagues at Oxford, uh, Oxford Brookes University, made the point that um, technology is never neutral or value free. There is always some ideology embedded in it. And um, in our case, as educationalists, I suppose that is rephrased as. Uh, every educational technology has a pedagogy embedded in it. Um, and actually not only, as I was, so I was in Gaza recently wor uh, working with the UN in schools that were largely, well clearly Islamic, um, and it made me think actually in conversations with the teachers there, it made me think that actually the remark I'd originally seen as highlighting the ideology embedded in VLEs or uh, interactive whiteboards or e-portfolios is as applicable to the way the room is arranged or the way that the architects structure how, how school premises look or how you choose the furniture or all the rest of it. Uh, so it's actually a quite, quite, quite systemic remark that um, the ideology that permeates technology permeates it in the broadest sense. Um, you know, so we have lecture rooms and classrooms and laboratories and all the rest of it, uh, or buildings laid out in a particular way, um, campuses laid out in a particular way, and all of them are in some sense sending signals, have embedded in them signals about um, the teaching ideology that's involved. Um, and, yeah, as I suppose in the case of ICT or e-learning, I, I worry that in, if mobile learning in Africa inherits... Um, some ideology, then it may be an inappropriate ideology. It may be social constructivism um, uh, or, so, or some variant on social constructivism uh, that is perfectly reasonable, maybe, um, in Western Europe. I'm not sure if our students think it is. Um, but there doesn't seem to me any good reason for thinking, thinking we can transfer it anywhere else at all. Um, so um, if one of the problems with technology-enhanced learning in Africa is perceived to be infrastructure or the physical stuff, um, I worry if that gets too much attention. If we think, okay, once we've built secure buildings or once we've provided everyone with computers, uh, that will be problem solved. I think actually that will only take us nearer to the real problem, which is the fact that different cultures, different people think and learn in different ways. And so the ideology embedded in a virtual learning environment, sorry, uh, uh, do I need to translate that? I can't remember. LMS, uh, things like Sakai, Moodle and all the rest of it. Um, just because we've now, you know, if we're on the verge of solving the problem about using an LMS in somewhere in Africa, doesn't mean that it's any more, any more appropriate just because we can make the hardware work. Uh, it may be culturally very inappropriate, but we haven't actually inspected that. Um, and of course, at a, at, a, at a more cynical, cruder level, um, there are an awful lot of salesmen, actually, salesmen uh, from large American corporations selling um, all sorts of educational software from North America, from Northern Europe, uh, and clearly presenting it as the solution to educational problems. Uh, and it is. It worked in Western Europe, so why isn't it going to work here? Um, so, as I say, I worry that um, 
uh, we place too much emphasis on overcoming infrastructural problems or cost problems, and actually that's not really uh, the big issue. Um, Oh, this is a slide from Jonathan Donner, if anyone knows him, who's now living in Cape Town, who works for Microsoft. And it was taken outside his office uh, in Bangalore, when he worked in Bangalore. Um, and it illustrates the, the, the example of missed calls. Um, now, sorry, in South Africa you call them a, a please call me, don't you, I think? Um, which I gather is the most popular traffic on uh, South African networks. Um, and it's an example of appropriation. Um, an appropriation is that business where a technology has a purpose designed into it, but actually once you put it in the hands of customers or users, it gets appropriated to their own purposes. So I guess you've, um, and that with phone technology, it's just because they are, if you like, so easy to understand and so ubiquitous um, and so relatively cheap, then there is a big community of users doing their best to appropriate or misappropriate this, those technologies as much and as often as possible. Um, so if you you have to think about my previous remarks in that context almost because what I was saying was that educational technology or mobile learning technology has a particular ideology built into it by people like me who design it. That doesn't mean it's fixed because it may get appropriated. People might find other things to do with it completely separate from um, uh, what we as educational technologists had in mind. I mean if you want to hear a kind of personal confession, um, I was responsible for a large project in Kenya uh, called SEMA, uh, which means something in, which is an acronym anyway, um, which used SMS to uh, support in-service teacher training nationally, and it was supposed to target 200,000 primary teachers, and I think we ended up working with about 70,000. Um, and uh, this is when I was young and naive, um, as opposed to old and naive, and um, thought that, okay, there was an infrastructural problem to be solved, and once we'd solved that, and we'd borne in mind that the coverage was good, we'd done a needs analysis, everyone had mobile phones, um, that actually what we could then do was establish something like a VLE, like uh, Sakai or Moodle, but entirely mediated by um, SMS. Um, and if you've read Jilly Salmon's book, for, or any of her work about e-moderating, you know, where she talks about creating communities of learners online where the, the, the tutor no longer teaches but actually, um, if you like, primes the online learners so that they become autonomous, a self-sustaining community, then I was kind of, at least at a, at a first pass, was hoping that we could kind of turn e-moderating into m-moderating and we'd look for ways of creating communities of learners, maybe geography teachers in... Navashu or um, social studies teachers uh, in Kisumu, whatever, um, that, that with the appropriate training of the mentors or the moderators or whatever, would then become um, self-sustaining communities of learners just like I have at home. Um, and it was a complete utter failure, he said off camera. Um, uh, what we did was create the largest chat room in the world for um, Kenyan primary school teachers to talk about the World Cup football results. Um, you know, and I have goodness knows how many megabytes of um, traffic from this system, uh, which are about um, social events, <coughs> uh, about um, uh, sports days. Um, if anything, if any of the messages were off message, I mean, if, sorry, if all the messages were off message pretty much. They were not about the school empowerment program. They were about just about everything else. Um, curiously, they were even about the project itself. They would say, oh, the English consultant is coming around tomorrow. Smarten up. Uh, say you've been using the system. Um, um, yeah, and I guess one way of looking... I mean, I'm sure there are lots of kind of incidental factors, but one of them I would kind of retrospectively read into it is that it was an attempt to... Um, impose an alien pedagogy um, into a culture for which, well, for which it was alien um, uh, and unsurprisingly it didn't work. Uh, and I think I kind of got some corroboration because I've done it in the UK and it pretty much did work. Um, you can do it. I mean you've got to just bear in mind these are different devices, they're not computers, the affordances and the sociology is different but there is the germ of an idea there, he said, hoping for vindication. Um, yeah, so uh, my argument is that you, yeah, we can't just port or parachute in um, 
pedagogy onto cultures for which it's alien. Ah, and this is one of George Bush's favourite countries. It's Africa. Um, one of the other um, concerns I had that's kind of related to the last one is the fact that um, if you look at UNESCO's statistics, it's probably not what people do very often, um, you'll find that of, I think it's Africa's 400 languages, um, uh, 200 of them are at risk. They're on the verge of extinction. So I think that when I'm talking about mobiles having allowed us to take learning into distant communities, I'm kind of on the verge of making a kind of Columbus discovered America remark. Columbus didn't discover America, there were people there already. And when I'm talking about taking learning into distant communities, I am actually talking about taking our learning into distant communities. And they may be, in some cases, just too fragile to, to um, withstand that. I saw someone in an interview yesterday talking about taking a sip of the fire hose. Uh, that's not a bad, bad metaphor for what I'm talking about. You know, I'm talking about connecting small communities with their culture, and with that I mean also their epistemology. The st how they learn stuff, what they learn, how they prove they've learned it, what it is they value learning and what they can't be bothered to learn. All of those things are local and specific to a culture. Uh, and all of a sudden we're talking about connecting them to the information superhighway where they could quite easily end up as roadkill. Um, so I think this is not ethically straightforward. It's not, an, it's, it's not ethically straightforward in the sense that there's a kind of ecological argument saying this is a really bad idea, we could wipe out a community or a culture. But on the other hand, we could also deny them access to the global knowledge economy, to national educational opportunities, uh, to all sorts of things. Um, and I can frame the problem like that. My next problem, having portrayed it as, as an ethical one, is how do I move forward? Because if I kind of sign up to the idea that we could move forward, we could do something with these communities, I need informed consent. But I'm not quite sure how you reconcile informed consent with blissful ignorance. Okay? That's your homework. Uh, um, so, as I say, mobiles and learning in Africa, I don't think, is straightforward. Oh, goodness. Uh, this is Stephen Fry, who's uh, uh, one of the UK's national treasures. Um, and um, uh, and ought to be Prime Minister if Michael Palin wasn't first in the queue. Um, but he's doing a series uh, about language at the moment, kind of even as we speak. And you might be able to get some of it on iPlayer. And he's talking about language, yeah? its evolution, its uses, its nuances, uh, its texts and its subtexts. Uh, and it's brilliant. So, yeah, do try and, and download it from an iPlayer. Um, but he talks about his view, um, which I guess chimes in with mine, that language and communal identity are almost synonymous. Um, that our language is the people we are. Our language is the community we are. Um, and therefore, you know, you threaten one and you threaten the other. Oh, he also says the third part of identity is food. Okay? Not on the basis that we are what we eat, but uh, something similar. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's different ways of looking at this. Um, but uh, I think all of them are, uh, can be uh, relatively problematic. Um, and this is a school in the Gaza Strip, uh, where I was about a fortnight ago. We were talking about using Facebook. Ah, there you are. <laughs> okay, this is the corollary. Um, this, the, the teacher's not in here, but um, he uses Facebook um, uh, for engaging with his students. And it, it kind of puts him on the line. Um, they're also using um, uh, messaging. So the, the inset is a messaging system in Arabic that they buy for use within the schools. And I was exploring how they might use those technologies as a part of the uh, UN's educational reform strategy. Um, but you then find out that some of the teachers and some of the heads and some of the UN authorities have received death threats because this is regarded as non-Islamic um, education. It's undermining their values. Um, you know, so on the one hand I'm talking about portraying what we do as taking, into, taking our learning, our culture into vulnerable communities. There's also the problem we might be taking it into ones that aren't vulnerable and might fight back. Uh, so this is, this is difficult. And there's also some work, for example, with um, Australian Aborigines 
which again is in this, you know, again, you, it's very easy to see them as a, uh, a disenfranchised underclass um, separated from educational opportunities, but also with a vulnerable culture that, uh, again, connecting to um, uh, corporate global um, uh, learning, or even to what some people call the power languages, English, French, uh, Arabic, um, it could jeopardise uh, their culture. Um, I think the corollary, uh, or the, the converse of um, the, 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 Do the Trojan horse image, actually, is this is a, a picture of a cargo cult. Again, I'm not sure if you're familiar with cargo cults, but they were a phenomenon um, documented in the Pacific in the uh, closing days of the Second World War, where um, American forces would land. This was kind of fighting their way from island to island. Um, American forces would land to communities that hadn't seen white men before. Uh, and these white men um, would build huts, and then they would then put up this metal thing and put a table up inside the hut and then put a metal box on it and they would talk into the metal box and if they talked long enough um, this big silver bird would come out of the sky, the front would open up and out would come cargo. Um, um, and I think actually uh, it was called a cargo cult because as soon as the Americans left the natives uh, did the same thing. They built a hut, they put a box on it, uh, they put it on a table, they talked into it and they, they, and they sat there waiting for cargo. Uh, but, it, well, unsurprisingly it didn't happen. But I'm not sure if um, um, in many cultures, meaning the UK is as much as anywhere else is, um, using computers in education is a cargo cult. That actually we go through the motions, we don't understand what's going on, we buy this stuff um, and then we expect uh, educational results to happen. Um, and I thought there are all sorts of um, uh, expectations that come along with computers in education or mobiles in education and it might just be a cargo cult, we might have got the wrong end of the stick, uh, it might be nothing to do with the technology for example. So, so that if you put the, the Trojan horse and the cargo cult side by side you've got kind of inappropriate expectations put there by the the sender and inappropriate expectations imposed on it by the recipient. Another metaphor. Uh, actually, you won't have any trouble with this. This is the um, the parable of the uh, the sower and the seeds. I think in looking at what we've done in mobile learning and possibly looking at what we've done in um, development, there is one ghastly overriding common denominator, and that's no sustainability. Um, and certainly from my perspective, working mainly, I guess, in mobile learning, um, it's often quite easy to see why. It's not soluble, but it's easy to, to articulate. Um, and that's because we've had a preoccupation um, with, as it were, the seed uh, and not with the soil. That there's been a, a focus on what it was we were developing, what it was we were sending out there, um, and not on the host community or the culture it was landing in. Um, and I think that almost parallels discussions I was having in Morocco about um, two years ago when I was visiting scientists there, which were to do with the fact that they, of necessity or by definition, had a very kind of technocentric um, mindset. I mean, they're actually funded by the Department of Science and Technology, um, so it's almost their default processes. And if, this might almost at that time have been a, a metaphor for Morocco very conscious of the seed, technologists developing stuff and then chucking it out and hoping that in some way or another it would embed and then being surprised that it didn't. Actually, so I, I've, having driven across um, Palestine a couple of times, I now this is a, an even more worrying metaphor because actually it's all stony ground. Um, uh, there's actually no way you could plant anything. And I think part of Maraca's response to that, or maybe a kind of more na a national response, has been looking at the idea of living labs, where you can kind of somehow create something more of a dialogue between maybe the technologists and the innovators and the, um, um, the communities uh, and maybe the social entrepreneurs, which, which has been, a, I think, have been a sticking point that... Um, from the way we organise things, it's very easy to set up closed, well-managed experiments that give us results, but don't tell us how chance or serendipity or individual initiative might take a hand 
um, and appropriate something for something we hadn't thought of. So as a, as a kind of how do you develop a sustainable technology embedded in the community, that is quite a challenge and I think um, that, that's one of the things Maraca have been working on with their um, Living Labs program. Um, one of the other problems we've had, I guess, is around evidence. And uh, with Agnes Kukulski, whom uh, and myself, we looked at um, the evidence, the evaluation of maybe 300 mobile learning projects uh, without making any distinction about where they'd come from or what they were trying to do. And I guess our uh, opinion, maybe, was that actually our research community was really, really dreadful at doing evaluation, at producing evidence. They were incompetent. Uh, we were incompetent, sorry, where we were incompetent. Um, so maybe, in one sense, it's no surprise that we have no sustainability because we're not very good at producing evidence that might, that might justify it. But I realised subsequently that... Um, uh, we were coming from a particular tradition, a tradition that you, know, you could crudely call big government, where the role of science and researchers was clearly articulated, even if it was a complete fantasy, that we would generate evidence that we would take to some intermediary body um, uh, who would then see it as some kind of proof of concept who would then fund some larger, I don't know, longitudinal study, multi-site study, that would then allow them to take evidence to government and that would unlock or divert public money and change public policy priorities. And I say it's a fantasy, well it was a fantasy even before the, our current government came in, um, and then who closed down all the intermediary bodies if nothing else and stopped all the money. Um, but of course it's only a fantasy that sounds plausible in countries of big government, you know, Scandinavian countries, Singapore, the UK. Um, and I think in countries of small government, where there isn't that kind of expectation that government is there to look after you from the cradle to the grave, uh, the role of evidence and the role of research becomes more problematic. You know, why are you doing it? What's the nature of the evidence you're supposed to be producing? Who are you producing it? What's your audience? What's the expected outcome? Um, what do you think will, will happen? That's, when I made this remark in a, at a keynote in Belgium, um, uh, Johannes Kronje, who some of you may, um, may know, put his hand up and said, you mean bad government, don't you? And I was at pains to point out that I meant small government, working in perfectly kind of transparent and honest ways, but actually not in a culture where um, those kinds of responsibilities were seen as government responsibilities, where the government just I don't know, policed the streets and defended the borders. Um, and I think that um, yeah, in countries of small government, th the role of research becomes quite problematic. Why are we doing it? What are we doing? Uh, are we just wasting our time? Is it actually ethical to do things that we know have, have no future? Um, uh, I don't know. Um, should we actually be directing our efforts to the kind of evidence that the business community would see as, as interesting and acceptable around developing sustainable business cases. I mean, I think there's a, a, another problem that, I don't know about development so much, but certainly around mobile learning, we've just had 10 years of small-scale, subsidised, fixed-term projects run by enthusiasts that produce evidence. Um, but sadly, that evidence only really credibly tells us something about small-term, fixed-term projects run by enthusiasts on subsidies and it tells us nothing at all about large-scale sustainable projects run by I don't know rank and file administrators, teachers or whoever who have no enthusiasm and it's just become part of their job um, or companies that want to make a profit out of it and the way we've been doing our research tells them nothing at all about how you make a profit. So I think um, uh, in some senses, we've run, out of, we've run out of road and there are a whole new set of challenges which we, we need to be addressing. One of the other things I noticed in, um, for example, doing field work in, in, in Kenya, I mean, I'm now moving on to talking about how do we reason, how do we infer about what we've done. Um, and I noticed, I think because I was in a team that was um, a, a technology person, um, an educationalist, or maybe a teacher or a teacher trainer, and a, and a policy person, that we'd go into a school and the outcomes would be good or the outcomes would be bad, and then we'd have a conversation about it. And the, the technologist would attribute the success or failure to the technology. 
The technology worked, therefore, that's why the project was a success. The educationalists would say, no, no, it was good teaching, um, uh, that's what solved the problem. Or it was bad teaching, and that's why the project is a failure. Um, and so hence this slide, which is, uh, which, uh, you know, th that old phrase about uh, if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, so if you're a technologist, then everything looks like a, th then that's your worldview. That's, that's how you pick out the relevant cause um, and effect. And I think that there's, a, there's, there's almost a corollary to that. I'm, I'm big on metaphors and images. This, this is a, a kind of an adaptation of the old story about, I think it's Brahmins, uh, blindfolded Brahmins trying to explain an elephant. Well, um, my point here is that if you have an elephant's tail, everything looks like a, a snake. Um, you know, how we understand reality uh, is really quite problematic, and understanding the reality of mobiles is even more problematic. Um, the more you try and understand them by conventional kind of scientific processes of minimising the variables or, or eliminating the confounding variables, the less kind of mobile it is. Um, uh, and I think that, that's been part of our problem, that, that actually, if you come at exploring mobile learning from a kind of scientific perspective, um, uh, it's very difficult to preserve the uh, essence of mobile learning because it's to do with uh, movement, mobility, um, multitasking and all the rest of it. And the signal to noise ratio is dreadful, but actually the more you reduce the noise, the less authentic it becomes. Uh, another illustration of, of uh, how I worry that our reasoning is faulty is when I was in South Africa before with Maraca and we were doing some field work, uh, I think this is on the road to somewhere in Limpopo to go to the living labs there. I was travelling with a Dutch consultant and um, at every junction um, outside the towns, as you cross the countryside itself, you, you see vendors of fruit juices. Uh, for example, and Darn, the, the, the other consultant, made the remark that actually it doesn't seem, doesn't make sense, because he'd done a little bit of asking around, it doesn't make sense that you see vendors all clustered together, all selling exactly the same thing, and then when you ask them, it turns out they all go to the supplier, to the wholesaler, together. It seems wholly irrational, and his point was, why are they such poor business people? Um, but I'm afraid, to me, it just illustrates that we don't understand what's going on. And if we start from kind of misunderstandings about, uh, you know, people's values and their lives, then it's hardly surprising that our projects don't, uh, don't sustain. Okay, recently with... Actually, I've, I noticed several people know the name of Doug Belshaw, and he'd be uh, delighted to know that people have read his work. He does a lot, does a lot of work for uh, JISC on the, the business of mobile... Sorry, of digital literacy. Um, but we did a workshop recently about case studies, uh, and it was very interesting because I suppose as an alternative to evidence um, and kind of pure research, the other way in which we expect uh, opinion uh, or values to be changed, practice or policy to be changed, is by case studies. And, and there's the kind of happy notion that, that um, various bodies, who might be agencies, who might be publishers, they publish these things in, um, as a kind of flat, neutral, um, objective depiction uh, of what happened. Uh, that here is six case studies, 12 case studies, whatever it is, and you're going to read them and you're going to learn something from them and it will alter your practice and it will change policy. And what we were trying to do with a group of people was um, was unpack what was going on both in an individual case study and then in a, in a collection, selection of them. You know, and the first thing when you look at case studies built around initiatives or projects is of course no one ever fails. There are no accounts of failure. Um, but secondly, you know, there's a whole business about how does editing and presenting and managing and organising what is being said uh, in a very concise form um, capture enough of the context um, for you to actually even port what they're saying into your context, let alone scale it up, heaven forbid. Um, and that, that was quite um, illuminating. And there are a whole lot of issues when you read something, an account of a project, um, that where there is clearly stuff that uh, wasn't worth mentioning or was taken for granted, um, that, you know, that d didn't make it into the headlines, uh, that could have been crucial. 
So, you know, I, again, I worry about how we learn from evidence and how we reason about what we've been doing. Um, and and uh, I think clearly the, the, the worst example is, that, is just the, uh, this more or less complete absence of failure. And, and having worked in funded projects, in some senses you can see that how that happens. Um, many, many projects are doomed to success. Um, you know, people's reputations, their funding, um, their careers are on the line. There is a momentum behind things. Um, you know, you can almost write the final report on the basis of having read the project proposal. Um, there is no longer much room for messing up. Um, um, but yet we're supposed to reason about that. Um, uh, and I think it's, you know, again, it accounts for why um, it is so difficult to sustain if what we're trying to build on is such shaky foundations and such shaky evidence. Uh, this is an arbitrary set of images, and that's the whole point. It's an arbitrary set of images. When we look at case studies, um, actually there might have been something subconscious going on when I chose these. I, I, so I'd rather you didn't kind of psychoanalyze me on, on the basis of, of this uh, unconscious choice. Um, actually, I don't even know what some of them are. Is that, is that a pomegranate on the top? Oh, so it was unconscious almost. Um, what we're doing, when we're present, presenting, presented with a case study or even a conference, um, and I made this remark about the USAID symposium recently, we're being presented with a number of instances and we're being encouraged to join up the dots and take away what we've figured out. Um, and apart from anything else, there are some non-dots missing, all the failed projects that didn't get written up. And clearly it's only, in this case, one, two, three, five dots. I mean, it's like the Greeks looking at the, the, dark, the, the night sky and joining up the dots and getting Hercules. Um, oh, sorry, that the Greeks did, other cultures obviously wouldn't. Um, which is interesting in itself, it's culturally dependent. You know, you, different cultures will join up the dots in different ways. But how you then, as I say, make inferences, generalizations, abstractions from such a limited um, number of instances uh, is really problematic. What's the takeaway? I don't know. Um, well, unless you've, unless you've read my subconscious and you can figure out what the takeaway is. Um, so I think, yeah, there are a number of reasons, endless, you know, that you'll see a catalogue of reasons developing now about why uh, what seemed to be a no-brainer about using mobiles to deliver learning in Africa is not going to be as easy as we thought. It's not a no-brainer after all, it's too much of a brainer, really. Um, another reason, actually, why we have trouble reasoning, I think, about how to use mobiles in learning is it's just a, an artifact that actually all of the research pretty much has been with um, devices that were bought and supplied by the project. Uh, that's partly handy because you can write hardware into the project budget um, and you come away owning 30 devices at the end of the project. But it's, it's also argued to be methodologically more satisfactory because you've removed one of the um, confounding variables, because if you just let anyone use whatever device they like, your results would be really all over the place, because that would be a confounding variable. But of course, you're never ever going to get a mobile learning project, least of all any, any project that's gone to any kind of scale, where you can afford year on year on year to buy the gadgets. Um, and certainly in the UK, the argument is moving in favour of um, using the learner's own devices um, because we can't afford to do anything else. And clearly that's an argument which would play in many parts of the world, including much of Africa, that we can't afford sustainable mobile learning if we think we're going to have to procure and provide the devices. We're going to have to use their devices. So any of the evidence we've collected over the last 10 years is completely irrelevant. I think one of the other things that's been happening kind of in the development community is you kind of get haunted by headline examples from slightly adjacent fields. This is an example from M-Pesa. You know, it's a runaway success. Everyone in Kenya is using it. It's micro-banking. It's taking banking to the, um, uh, to the unbanked. Um, it's getting to the bottom of the pyramid almost. Why can't you do that in education? Um, you know, it's easy. They've done it. Um, um, I think we're kind of haunted by that. But again, it's, it's um, being haunted, haunted by potentially faulty reason. What is it exactly we're supposed to learn from M-Pesa? What should we be copying? How did they do it? Is there anything we can learn from it? And, I, you know, probably not much, but we just all end up feeling rather browbeaten uh, because they're a runaway success and we're a runaway failure. And there's another maybe relevant um, example 
which is the hole in the wall uh, experiment of Sugatra Mitras in uh, India and now in Newcastle. Uh, figure out the common denominator. Um, certainly not climatic. Um, uh, sorry, Newcastle, UK. You've probably got one, haven't you? You've got a Newcastle? Yeah, typical. Um, and if we take uh, Mitra's thinking uh, and you kind of just provide the machinery and with open access, as he did, uh, certainly in his early stages. You know, his argument is, oh, just let people learn, discovery learning. They're, you know, they access the whole World Wide Web and they learn from it. I think that's got a number of possible problems. One is they're all looking at pornography. Um, but another might be that I'm not sure if an unguided and, and purely kind of serendipitous process will necessarily lead you to an understanding of the world that is the consensual one, that is the right one. Um, uh, you know, because, again, you're just kind of following your curiosity. You're going to, if, again, if you like, a number of dots. And you might end up um, deciding the universe is um, uh, geocentric, not heliocentric. You know, there's not much, you know, if you look at the um, 16th century, there's not much evidential difference um, underpinning a geocentric universe and a heliocentric universe. Uh, it's just like them kind of looking at the night sky and deciding the universe is geocentric. It's not, well... Uh, to a first order of magnitude, it's not. But sorry, I'm just trying to make the point that I don't think you can necessarily assume that provide the hardware um, and the rest will take care of itself. It could go wildly, wildly wrong. And uh, I think Maraca were, um, have a project in South Africa called Digital Doorway, which is um, uh, an analogous kind of technology. It's not a hole in the wall, it's a, a plinth, uh, which they, they proudly tell you has the world's most um, impact-proof keyboard. Um, that says something about... Um, uh, and, and then a kind of quartz screen. Um, to go back to the issue of sustainability, actually I gave a talk in Bremen about this, about sustainability, and some, someone tweeted, John Traxler just mentioned the elephant in the room, which I thought was wonderful. So I can't resist elephant titles any longer. This is um, the public toilets in Brighton. Uh, sorry, Brighton, UK. Um, and uh, it was built in the, uh, the high, I was going to say high watermark, that's not a good phrase to use about toilets, is it? Um, at the high watermark of um, Victorian capitalism, you know, free, fr uh, free range, free enterprise, as it were. Um, and I've used it as a, as a, a metaphor for um, the potential for a sustainable um, l learning using mobiles in, if you like, a small government context. Um, Victorian England was small government, no argument. And, uh, and I suppose what you had, the situation there was um, a number of the population who, to coin a phrase, wanted to spend a penny. Do I need to explain that cultural reference? I hope not. Um, OK, you had, a, you, you had the population wanting to spend their pennies. Um, and on the other hand, you had um, large companies who made things like bricks and um, porcelain and ceramics. Um, who are, as it were, analogous to the, the mobile phone networks or the publishers or whoever. Um, there is no business case for a brick manufacturer building a public toilet. Uh, the diseconomies of scale would be prohibitive. They don't have the expertise. They don't have most of the components. They don't know how to reach their audience. Um, but if, they ca if there is a way of doing it, if there is a kind of virtuous ecology then it's kind of the solution to our problems. Because, as I say, there is, on the one hand, a big... I was going to say audience. I'm not sure if that's the right word. But there is a large target population of people who want to spend a penny. Um, and that might be true for learning as well. They, ha you know, they don't have much money, but there's a lot of them. Um, and on the other hand, you have specialised global corporations who do one thing or they do another. And if there was a way of bringing them together... And clearly, you don't build one public toilet. You build thousands, millions. The more, the better. Um, then you've, you've kind of solved that problem about a sustainable ecology in uh, a society where the government doesn't necessarily pick up much of the slack. I, I was first, uh, my office used to be just over the road from this, by the way. Um, that's partly why I've got the photograph. Um, it, it, as, a, as an aside, the reason it, I originally had the photograph taken was because it was pointed out this was um, a metaphor for the whole British imperial project. Um, at the top, you had the clock, which was timekeeping, punctuality. 
In the middle you had the royal family, you can't see, but there's, um, I think that one's Prince Albert, Victoria, and so on, which is hierarchy, stability. And then underground you had the toilets, which was uh, cleanliness and hygiene. And that's what my empire stood for in those days. What do we do, to, on the one hand, to get out of the kind of cycle of small-scale projects that go nowhere, uh, and into a situation where we are somehow or other priming the pump that takes us to a, a as I say, my phrase, a sustainable ecology. And I don't really know what the answer is. And clearly part of what I'm saying is um, that I think it's highly context dependent. It depends on where you are and on the culture and the locality and all the rest of it. And at the moment, my worry is um, that the solution will be portrayed in global and corporate terms. Uh, that actually what will get squeezed out in arriving at this uh, economically viable scenario is actually communities and individuals. Um, uh, so I worry about, if you like, the tension between localised, which is the word they all want to use, and local. Uh, that localised means, well, in projects uh, that I've been involved with, it means we, um, we take the teacups off the interface and we put coffee cups on or we take the red buses off and we put New York taxis on, that it's it, it kind of, I suppose, if I were being philosophical, I would say it's essentialist. It assumes there is some essential, stable idea about education, and all we need to do in order to transplant it into other cultures is just to scrape off the veneer and put the appro culturally appropriate veneer on top, and it's called localised. Um, and I worry that, that if that's how we're going to succeed, it's not a very nice way to succeed, I don't think. And I've, uh, I've, uh, so I've also been looking for, you know, are there spaces in which uh, there might be room for um, local activity? And again, I'm looking for parallels, and I might be reasoning as badly as everyone else. Uh, so this is a reference to barefoot doctors. Um, in Kenya, um, um, the, the state provides a given number of teachers per village based on, on census uh, or based on the headcount of kids for example but often the community then clubs together uh, to pay for some extra teachers uh, that work alongside the state funded ones so our barefoot doctors you know is that the kind of image for where local activity would fit in uh, the community teachers in Kenya in the UK uh, in the early 70s many people were, were dissatisfied with the um, the state education system, you know, which they saw as a kind of education for political conformity, and started free schools, very much along the lines of uh, Ivan Illich, for example, uh, or Pablo Freire. You know, so uh, are, are there, is there any hope, is there examples we can draw on, are there ways of inserting those kind of, if you like, social entrepreneurs uh, into this ecology? Uh, I'm not convinced, you know, we're on strong ground. I was at um, the ICTD conference in uh, Qatar in 2009, I think, where Bill Gates gave one of the keynotes. Um, and someone asked him about the role of social entrepreneurs. Um, and he said, what? Well, he, he said it in American, obviously. Um, and he had to have it explained to him. Um, and I rather got the impression that where he's coming from, which is kind of understandable because he's been really successful coming from where he's come from, but there's a, a way of approaching stuff as problems, problems to be solved, and problems to be solved by some technological magic bullet. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cure malaria, we'll move on, we'll cure HIV AIDS, we'll move on, and it's going to be done by a technological intervention or a, a, a kind of problem-solving intervention maybe, which takes us back to my um, image of the, the sower and the seed. Again, too much focus on, if you like, a kind of te technocentric, a specific intervention that, that kind of ignores the culture. And I think there's stories about um, attempting to solve malaria in communities by giving local people um, mosquito nets, and then half or a third of them get used for fishing. Um, and, and if you saw it from their point of view, well, it's actually, I either catch some fish or I starve, uh, or I take my chances with malaria. Well, the starving is fairly certain, and the malaria is probabilistic, so you can see why they do it, even from a kind of um, purely rational uh, and Western perspective. Yeah, as I've said, this, is, this was taken in, uh, near the Kruger, um, uh, and is one of the um, uh, maracas. Sorry, I, I, I don't think I ought to be saying maraca, because I think the Living Labs network is slightly broader. Uh, than them, but I think they, they host it and they look after it and they provide some of the infrastructure. Um, 
you know, I think that is potentially some way forward in which my image of um, social entrepreneurs and um, uh, barefoot doctors might have some, uh, some traction. But what I've also seen at the same time is in trying to develop um, uh, appropriate learning on mobiles, um, the growth of new design methods, participative design or user-centered design, uh, which is at first sight quite attractive because, again, the community, the users, the learners are, are engaged. Um, but I think there are some challenges. I mean, one is that it, um, much of this stuff involves dialogue or, or discourse. And actually, where you've got, as it were, like talking to like, um, the dialogue is not so problematic. There are not issues about stuff that isn't worth mentioning and stuff that gets taken for granted because um, in a common culture, stuff that doesn't get mentioned is still understood. It's still uh, intuited or implied. Um, and so I think it works potentially quite well with a UK researcher working in the UK, where maybe a white middle class researcher working with white middle class kids, or better still, with people of the same age group, uh, you know, it works well because the discourse is uh, on a stable platform of, of understanding. If we're to use these kinds of methods um, where there is kind of big discrepancies, so for example, um, you know, someone from a South African university, um, you know, who is going to be middle class and well educated, working with um, community groups, there is a lot more um, space for stuff to slip through the gaps. Um, having said that, I think, you know, people are making progress, like Matthew Cam and John Canny in South India, for example, uh, are finding ways of working with kids in schools or with intermediaries so that we're not playing Chinese whispers. Uh, you know, there are not messages getting garbled, uh, you know, and where what they say differs from what we hear. Um, but I also think there's another issue which kind of relates back to my slide from Gaza, which is actually many people, if, you, if you're trying to use user-centered design methods and um, participative development of educational software, there is the possibility that many of us who might see ourselves as progressive and liberal might encounter people uh, in communities who are certainly not. Uh, and so there's a tension between what seems to be an education that's authentic to their experiences and their values and what we might see as progressive um, and participative. Uh, so, I th so again, kind of creating a, a kind of shared movement forward is, I think, um, quite challenging. OK, uh, a few closing remarks. Um, almost. <laughs> yeah, almost. You'll yeah, be glad to know. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about overlaps with the work of the um, M4D community, Mobiles for Development. And I suppose this is a bit of a plea, could they listen to us? Um, because I think there is um, a tendency uh, in, in going to their conferences or listening to, uh, reading what they write, to see using mobiles for learning in development context as somehow just the same as using it for healthcare or using it for governance uh, or, for, or for jobs or for... Um, uh, supporting small to medium sized enterprises and so on. Um, what they're doing is seeing, it, uh, seeing the technology as a load of um, dumb pipes. It's just learning, it's just a case of sticking stuff in one end and um, the mobiles allow it to get further out. You know, dumb receptacles and dumb pipes. And I, I worry that in doing, in taking that view, uh, I mean, clearly it's less challenging from where they're coming from, which is not an educational. Uh, tradition, uh, that it's missing out the kind of transformative effects. Um, people don't, are not educated and then unchanged, they're educated and changed. That's, speaking as a liberal, that's the whole point. Um, so I think we need to fi somehow find a way of uh, kind of making our message a bit more, to carry that part of our message across as well, that, that that's what education is about, changing who people are, how they think, uh, not just pushing stuff out. But I think actually not only do mobiles change the nature of, it, of education and well not only do mobiles not only does education change people but I think mobiles are changing education. And this is a reference to um, citizen journalism uh, which is the the practice of people in the streets the ordinary punter taking pictures of n news events as they unfold putting them on um, uh, 
some kind of sharing technology like Flickr or YouTube and allowing the world to watch. And it's portrayed um, as a kind of democratisation of the news process uh, because it's allowing ordinary people to capture what's going on. It's not mediated by the BBC or the Ministry of Information or whatever, and it's allowing people access it. And I think this is a, a kind of reference to the fact that these technologies, more than computers, allow people to generate ideas and images, to share them, to discuss them. Um, and that's actually, and if you look, if you think about the words you might use about this kind of activity, generating ideas, opinions, images, information, sharing them, storing them, transmitting them, um, you're very much talking about what education is supposed to be about. Uh, just that it's a kind of education that's outside the formal institutions, that's um, to some extent out of control, or the nature of the control is rather different. That's controlled by Flickr, maybe, rather than controlled by the Ministry of Education. Um, so I think not only is education transformative, but education is being transformed by these, uh, these um, media. Uh, but it's also, uh, this, this is more, this is citizen journalism pictures, if you like, of the uh, September, no, sorry, July the 7th bombings in London um, a few years back. And uh, you could say they're a classic case of citizen journalism. Uh, they are plucky Londoners um, on their way to work being blown to bits. Uh, and some of the some of the newsreel footage was classic British British phlegm. Um, uh, you know, people w would come out of a tube train covered in blood, um, uh, and one one guy actually says they think this is bad. The test match has been called off. Um, um, anyway, so enough of that. Um, yeah, and so but that was the spin that it was as I say, plucky Londoners, Blitz Creek, uh, Blitz London Blitz spirit, all of that stuff. But it's as easy to put a different spin on it, which was this, just the uh, jihadists take um, uh, the crus no, the crusade's not going to be the right word, is it? Jihadists take the fight into the heart of the infidels. Um, you know, and that spin could have easily been inserted into this citizen journalism. So I think if you take that citizen journalism as a, a microcosm of the way that these technologies can generate ideas and images and actually can generate identities uh, as a kind of microcosm for the changes that um, these uh, that a bit can be brought about in knowing uh, and therefore learning, then um, that's all the more reason for seeing um, mobiles in learning as not merely um, dumb pipes and uh, dumb dumb conduits. I, I suppose that much of the work we've done has been informed by a kind of modernist empirical mindset, and I think that's why we're having problems, and that's why we're ha especially having problems with looking at how we use mobiles. Uh, the whole business of mobiles in society and therefore how they might support learning. And th that's as true in Af Africa, anywhere in Africa as it is uh, in Western Europe, it is that we're having trouble capturing the essence of the thing, and that's partly maybe because we think there is an essence of the thing. It's actually enormously messy. Um, and so that's one an yet another reason why I think we have trouble um, reasoning about it. Um, uh, and if you like, this is back to this is back to Bill Gates. You know, the the notion that there is going to be a purely technological uh, solution to the problem. There's going to be a silver bullet, a silver bullet that will that will deal with the issue once and for all. Um, but we haven't got any kind of competing metaphors. You know, do we? Um, I thought briefly about the idea of rich pictures and soft systems methodologies. Uh, 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 you know, whether there is a, a way of using that in development contexts um, as opposed to the kind of hegemony of you know, this corporate technocentric way of, of looking at things. Uh, it'd be nice if there were. Um, uh, and finally, um, really, really, really finally? Yeah, I think finally. Um, I think part of our problem has been, yeah, as I was saying, there is a kind of particularly modernist mindset that thinks there is a, a kind of empirical way of doing things. And I have argued elsewhere that I think this is getting us into trouble, that actually um, mobiles not only transform the nature of knowing and what we know, or they transform, if you like, epistemologies, but lots of other aspects of our societies, um, African ones as much as European ones. If, um, uh, so I, I have looked at um, the notion of timekeeping and punctuality, uh, the no notions of space and place, uh, locality, 
the notions of uh, ethics and appropriate behaviour. Um, and all of those are moving on. Uh, I mean, they are kind of fragmenting, they become more transient, more local, more partial. Um, and again, if we're, tr if we're still trying to reason about what we're doing in the way that we did sometime shortly after the French Revolution, it's hardly surprising we're not very good at it, or, or it doesn't seem to work as well as it, it used to. Um, and, um, and a particular kind of, uh, sorry, uh, one um, postmodern thinker um, talks about meta narratives the, the, uh, the, or grand narratives. You know, the idea that for 200 years we've thought in terms of um, some overarching kind of themes that uh, history is going somewhere uh, and it's going somewhere good um, and that. Um, uh, let me see, um, that right and wrong are easy to differentiate, that cause and effect are easy to reason about, um, that science, education and technology are basically benign and will help us get to the sunny uplands of improved societies that much quicker. Um, those are the kind of meta-narratives or the grand narratives you know, that Europeans have lived with the last 200 years. Um, you know, they don't seem to have noticed um, you know, the Holocaust or um, the atom bomb, which were clearly sci triumphs of science and organisation and engineering and empiricism. Um, but development, I think, is also one of those meta-narratives, uh, you know, some overarching theme that we inadvertently subscribe to, subscribe to. And I worry that lots of people in, in ministries and in education systems uh, subscribe to that, that notion as well. So again, I think that is one of again one of the problems we have with trying to reason about the place um, or the future of mobiles um, in education in Africa and elsewhere. So I'll stop there.